Welcome to Between Two Perns. My name is Jackson Digger, and I'm joined here by Peter B. Brett, the international best-selling author of the Demon Cycle series. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. It's been a while since I've done a serious interview, so like, I'm excited to talk about the books. Thank you yeah. so much for taking the time away from busy New York Comic Con to have an interview. Always happy to do it. I'm a serious journalist. You used to sell drugs for a living, and now you're an author. Sure. Do you think drugs are the gateway to literary success? Most of my drugs were technically legal drugs. Uh, so uh, drugs have helped many people to live better lives. So I think that it's fair to say that that, that could be a gateway. And yeah. they've, they've helped you, clearly. Uh, sure, I enjoy we, drugs quite a bit. Da, 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 da. It's the one and only Eagle Double G. You know, there's a drugs that uh, put my kids at school. Like, yeah, yeah. The premise of your books is that there's another realm called the core and that demons can travel from there via magical tunnels underneath the earth. Uh, they come out at night to hunt humans who protect themselves with wards. So you wrote a pentology in this world and then you wrote novella and then you wrote a trilogy all in the same world. You have no books written in other worlds as I understand it. Is that correct? I am currently writing another book in another world. It's good to hear that you're writing in a new world just because I, I didn't know if you were a one-trick pony or if you had anything else, but it sounds like you do. I do, I do. And, and you know, seven books in, like, I, I like to think there's an occasional different trick in, in each book. So, uh, but no, I'm finishing off my Demon Cycle series, my Demon Cycle sequel series, and then I'm going to move into something else entirely and see if this pony has some additional tricks. You wrote your first book entirely on your subway commute to your day job while you were still working as a drug mule. Sure. <laughs> Do you still write on your phone or have you found an even more inconvenient and painstaking way of writing novels? So I still do mobile writing, but not nearly as much as I used to because uh, now I can just work from home at an actual computer. Okay. But I, I still write more words per minute on the subway than anywhere else. So if, you, if you're really trying to get that first novel done, the subway is the place to do yeah, it. Yeah, I would get on the subway in the morning. I would, like, shove an old lady out of the way so I could get a seat. And I'd put on my headphones so I could tune anybody out. And then I would just write from Brooklyn to Times Square. Okay. And that, like, in that 45 minutes, I would write, like, 500 words. Well, and I could never write 500 words in 45 minutes at home when I have other stuff to do, so... Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of writing location, everybody knows that it plays a huge role in uh, the way a book shakes up, and especially the book's quality. Yeah. A lot of people choose libraries, coffee shops, or the comfort of their own home, and those books are usually solid. Uh, but everybody knows the best books are written on cruises or at luxurious writing retreats with castles or foreign countries. Do you think the reason that your writing has improved is because you no longer write on the subway? I don't know that my writing is improved, but uh, I feel like the, the chaos of the New York subway like can make a more compelling story because you never know what's going to happen next, and that's the feeling that you want when you're reading a book, too. So, like, sometimes when I'm writing on the subway, like, a fight will break out or there'll be a murder or something, and that... Yeah, I can work that right into the stories. And so it's like, it's good that way. Your books are international bestsellers with a 4.5 rating on Amazon with nearly 10,000 reviews, which is a phenomenal achievement. However, it seems like some people still think that you're writing that subway quality material that you yeah. admitted you sort of are. I thought it might be fun to hear from now. So here are some oh my goodness. one star reviews that I thought were interesting. Don't bother. Read back of your shampoo bottle instead. Better plot and character development. Do you think this reviewer might be onto something and that the next evolution of publishing will be putting stories on the back of shampoo bottles? I've never actually read the back of a shampoo bottle, so I couldn't tell you what the quality level of the storytelling is, but I expect it's comparable. Oh, be fair. Wouldn't recommend it if free. OMG, this was bad and predictable. This is an area that I actually thought I could help you out a little bit of it. Um, you should write the story like normal. And then at the end of the book, the last chapter just says, and then the earth exploded and they all died. Um, do you think that would help solve the predictability issue? Um, I think the first time I did that, it would solve the problem. But then by the, by the second book, people would be wise to that trick. But you, would, you wouldn't need a second book. They're all, they're all dead. Sure, I'd need new people. Right. But 
The thing, the nice thing about made up people is that you can always get more of them. Yeah. It's an infinite resource. Warded man is the reason I no longer trust Amazon reviews. Are you concerned that Amazon might pursue legal action against you since you have single-handedly destroyed the credibility of reviews on their platform? I mean, look, I know that Amazon is really suffering these days. People aren't sure that business is going to last. I mean, it's sort of just a fad. Sure. But I think they'll survive. I think they'll survive. Despite your D best efforts? Despite me ruining the, the, the quality of their review system, I think that they'll manage. Okay. They're going to be okay. The last one we've got here is, I wish I could unread this book. I thought maybe you could reach out to your friends in pharmaceuticals and make a drug for this. I see this kind of reaction to books all the time. There are side effects that yeah. will, will take away your short-term memory. So, like, you would have to take the drug right after you read the book. You would have to know right away that you want to blank that out. Yeah. But we can make that happen. I was going to say, maybe you could bundle it with your book in the future. That way, you know. Like they, a blue pill and a red pill? Yeah, and they don't just they don't like it at the end. Just pop one and you're good. That's a deal. It absolutely is. Yeah. And I have a feeling the pharmaceutical companies would be a big fan of that. There would be a good, like, cross-marketing opportunity there. Absolutely. And the pharma companies have some good marketing dollars. So yeah. that'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah. That's a good idea. Thanks for that. Can I take that idea? Yeah, no problem. 10%. I get 10%. We'll work that out. Okay. Okay. A common theme of some of the other one-star reviews, though, is complaining about misogyny. On your blog post, in which uh, you detail your subway riding process, you admit to only offering your seat to the pregnant or elderly women. Sure. But unless you fell into those two categories, you never offered your seat since it's easier to write sitting down on the subway. Sure. In your books, demons come from beneath the Earth's surface. Do you think that this was a subconscious metaphor for your demonic selfishness against your fellow man, woman, and child underground in the subway coming through in your books? Living in New York City hardens you a little bit. And so uh, I would never take a seat from somebody that really needed it. But once I have the seat, you got to really need it before I'm willing to get up. It's going to work. But, like, I don't know that it's demonic of me to feel that way. I just, uh, you know, I guess I do hate my fellow man a little bit. Right. But I wouldn't direct it specifically at any gender or specific group it's more of a general disdain for mankind just for humanity yeah yeah i mean i, I think we've all got that, that right uh, we've all got that a little bit that makes perfect sense yeah. thank you so i i, I think feel that people that think it's targeted are maybe overdoing it it's just everybody you're you're missing the bigger picture sure yeah right. now you might have given some answers throughout this interview that aren't 100 percent honest or completely reflect your opinion sir But I want you to be honest on this question. Okay. Did you write the first book because you wanted to have a way to rationalize aggressively claiming seats on the subway? Is this just a life hack that's gotten out of hand? I mean, I'm pretending that I started claiming seats on the subway just to, just to write. But I would also claim seats so I could sit and read a Wheel of Time book, too. So I'm not like, you know, like, I think I was always an aggressive seat taker. Okay. On the subway, if I'm keeping it 100. Yes, and no. I appreciate that. I don't want to just pretend that it was uh, it was selfless in, in me doing my craft. I'm also pretty selfish in general times too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Some of the best reviews you have compare your work to other talented authors who clearly write their books in much nicer settings than you do. Mm -hmm. Sanderson, Martin, Rothfuss, uh, they're all comps I see frequently on your books. Really terrible people to be compared to. Like, right. Really in the loser's camp there, but... Yeah. The, like, do you think these authors are offended to have their work compared to yours? I think they take it as a big compliment. Do you? Yeah. I write pretty good books. So, like, they should be proud to be considered as comps. Maybe those guys will get a couple of extra readers because of me. Yeah. And they could use it, really. None of them, none of them are as successful as they deserve to be. And so I, I don't know if you've heard of the trend that's happening around this sort of thing right now. So this may kind of, I'm an old man. So tell me the trend. Okay. So it happens all the time where reviewers say that a good book is similar to a worse book. Um, are you aware that authors are now referring to this phenomenon as getting Peter B. Breddit? Am I the good, am I the good book or the worst book? 
Let's go to the next question. Okay, okay, okay. I think the author who gets Peter B. Breaded the most might be Brent Wheat. Uh, there's often confusion as to whether or not the two of you are the same person. Um, do you think the confusion has hurt his career? And is it true that you have an agreement with Weeks where he gets a percentage of your royalties due to this confusion? The truth is, if this is just between us, can we do this off the record? Yeah, this is off the, the record. The truth is, Brandon Sanderson writes both of our books. Wow. And just, and, and like just, he, did, he didn't think people would believe that he was writing that many books. Right. And so he just changes the name. I think you might be getting played a little bit by Sanderson here. I mean, because Sanderson's not writing them, it's the court stenographer skill. Oh, you are going to tell me about that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think this is sort of a, uh, a pyramid scheme that we've got going on here in I, the publishing I, world. I've always believed that Brandon has like a basement of writers like chained to desks yeah. who are just putting out material constantly. Mm. But like I benefit from it because I get to claim them as my own. Right. So. Well, it works for me. I was going to say, if it, if it makes you feel any better, it's not writers chained to desks. It's court stenographers who are very well compensated. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. What is your best piece of writing advice for new authors? I think the best piece is whatever book that you're working on, you might have to be prepared to throw it away and walk away and write something better. And, um, the hardest thing for a writer to do is take something that they've worked hundreds of hours on and put it aside and write something better using what they've learned. But every successful author I know has books like, has books, I wrote a whole book and then I couldn't sell it, it wasn't good enough, but I then wrote a better one. And so you have to be willing to make that jump. And I think a lot of authors are not willing to make that jump to like throw something like something they spent so much time into in the trash. Uh, but you got to do it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, I'm, I'm worried that this interview is getting a little bit too predictable. So really quick, we've got to do a little. Welcome to Between Two Ferns. My name is Jackson Dicker, and I'm joined here by Peter B. Brett, the international best-selling author of the Demon Cycle series. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being here. It's been a while since I've done a serious interview, so like, I'm excited to talk about the books. Yeah, 